Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 132, Richard III at Shakespeare's Globe. In the summer of 2024, Shakespeare's Globe in London, the reconstruction of the original Globe Theatre on the south bank of the River Thames, embarked on a production of Richard III. No surprises there. Shakespeare's Globe focuses on the Shakespeare canon, not to the exclusion of occasional modern plays and those by other early modern playwrights. But Shakespeare is their main purpose, and Richard III remains as much a crowd pleaser as it ever was, so always a good play to have in a season's repertoire. As I was rapidly heading towards the play myself on the podcast, I decided to take myself off to Shakespeare's Globe and be a groundling for the afternoon. I picked a spot at one corner of the stage and settled in for the play as best one can when standing on a hard floor. Fortunately, it's now concrete rather than nutshells and reeds. Being a groundling at the Globe is, in that sense, a sanitised experience. I was fortunate that this year's rather poor English summer came good that afternoon and I spent a very enjoyable few hours watching the play in the open air. I found much to like in the production, but also some things that worried me. I came with as open a mind as possible, but before the day of the performance I was seeing came along, there had been much debate about this production and some of it had been very heated. Michelle Terry is the current Artistic Director of Shakespeare's Globe, a position that she has held since 2018. She has a fine history of work with Shakespeare's leading roles, having been a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company, where her roles included performances in The Winter's Tale, Love's Labour's Lost and Pericles, among many others. Then she played Henry V at the Regent's Park Open Air Theatre, which was a generally very well-received production. At Shakespeare's Globe, she has performed in A Midsummer Night's Dream, Love's Labour's Lost, and as Rosalind in a particularly well-regarded As You Like It. She continued her involvement in gender-fluid productions when, in 2018, she played Hamlet. Not everybody liked her interpretation, but criticism was generally not about the cross-gender casting, but more about the handling of the big themes of the play. So, it should have been no surprise when Terry announced that she would be taking the lead role in Richard III. The director for the production was L. Weil, an associate artist at Shakespeare's Globe and another creative with a CV full of Shakespeare and modern, high-profile and successful productions. What evidently did surprise Michelle Terry and the board of Shakespeare's Globe was the critical backlash after the announcement, not so much because of the cross-gender casting, although there was some of that, but because she is an able-bodied actress. Looking back over the reaction to previous able-bodied Richards in recent years, such as Ray Fiennes in 2016, and even another female interpretation in the form of Adoa Anjo in 2023, I couldn't find such a degree of vitriol expressed in their direction as was against Michelle Terry. That is, I think, interesting particularly in the case of the Ray Fiennes production at the Almeida Theatre, where director Rupert Gould decided to include a visceral rape scene where in Act 4, Scene 4, Richard displays his power over Elizabeth with a physical attack. This just before sending her off to procure her daughter for him. Richard portrayed as a sexual predator is not a new concept, but certainly ruffled many feathers in 2016 with that production but it didn't result in a wave of online objection and vitriol. It was, of course, nearly a decade ago, where it's possible that social media was having slightly less influence and sensibilities had yet to be turned and tuned by more recent events. Bearing in mind that at this point nobody had seen any element of the production apart from a publicity still that showed Terry sitting with an arrogant expression on a throne and with a sketched-in crown slipping off her head, there were assumptions being made about the level of deformity that she would choose to portray. For many, particularly those with only a passing interest, what is most known about Richard is his deformity, or at least the deformity that Shakespeare places on him. Over the last few podcast episodes, you have heard how it's likely that Richard, despite his scoliosis, showed little physical deformity, and that Shakespeare's interpretation is an exaggeration and nothing more than part of the Tudor propaganda of the time. 
At a subtler level within the play, we also have to consider how to interpret Richard's own description of himself, which he uses to justify his actions in the context of the lies he tells and the deceits that he engineers. That often broken rule of not criticising a production until you've seen it was once again shattered here, so much so that Terry and the Globe felt the need to come out and defend the production in a series of interviews that appeared about the time when the play opened. Although it is a pity that they felt the need to do that, it does give us some insight into the thought processes behind the production. And at this point, for the avoidance of doubt, I should say that in this production Richard was played with no obvious deformity, and Terry did much energetic strutting about the stage, as if to underline the point. In addition, all of the lines pertaining to Richard's look, to his ill-formed body, including what he says about himself, were cut. In fact, the play was very heavily cut, to the exclusion of some of Shakespeare's best verse in the play, and to the extent that we did not even hear Richard offering a kingdom for his horse. Quite a bold move. In the interviews Terry explained that the planning of a theatrical season at Shakespeare's Globe happens at least a year in advance, so the creative team have to second-guess where the world will be and what plays might be, quote, relevant, useful and necessary. In fact, second-guessing 2024 was not the hardest job that they'd ever had. With 73 countries due to undertake general elections in 2024, it seemed pretty obvious that plays that question what leadership is, what it looks like and what particular behaviours leaders should display were the ones to go for. One look at the Shakespeare canon and Richard III must have leapt out at them. That is especially true in 2022 and 2023, when the rise of populist and nationalistic leaders was very much in the political and social agenda, and the political divides seem to be getting even more trenchant. The character of Richard also allows for questions about male behaviours, predatory male behaviours, and abusive, misogynistic male behaviours to be raised. But in addition to that, what the production was hoping to show was the effect of those behaviours, and therefore the behaviour of powerful narcissists in general, on those around the perpetrator. As Terry put it, quote, In this play, straight off the bat, in comes Margaret, and is saying, in plain sight, look at what is happening. Elizabeth says, in plain sight, look at what is happening. And then he even plays the scene out where, between them, they are arguing over a 14-year-old girl. End quote. Shakespeare was, in effect, addressing the very behaviours that we were witnessing in the world and asking what, as citizens, we can do about it. Terry doesn't deny that the play could be focused on Richard's disabilities and his way of dealing with them, but this was not the focus of this particular production. As she said when asked if she felt any resentment at the preemptive backlash, even after she and Shakespeare's Globe had held talks with some of those expressing concern, she said, and I quote, No, because I think the argument is sound. I think the inequalities of our sector, the inequalities of our society, are really real. So when you find somewhere to go and listen, we have to be heard. These are the things that we need to talk about that I can completely understand. But I think a play and one production will buckle under the weight of just how unjust and unjust society is in terms of disability justice. But I think also it was really important that we were signalling Richard III as the oppressor, not the oppressed. So, if anything, we just have to make sure that that was really, really clear. Predator and tyrant. Terry's performance, as I said, was energetic, bordering on the manic. As Richard, she prowled around the stage, always on the lookout for the next opportunity, and to discover the next untrustworthy helper that would have to be dealt with. She portrayed Richard with peroxide blonde hair, masculine clothing of tight jeans and leather jackets, Richard was always referred to as he, and she wore a selection of cod pieces that became ever more obvious, from jewelled to spiked, and so large that she was forced into the wide-legged power stance beloved by some politicians. And then there was the chest. At times, Terry appeared with a fake bare six-pack chest. One commentator described it not inaccurately as Putin-esque. 
Terry felt that the costuming and the general aesthetic of the production was important in relation to the behaviour of dictators and would-be dictators. Quote, The excess is really key. Excess and spectacle underpin their behaviours and underpin their regime, so they know the power of spectacle and they know the power of aesthetic, and then embodying that is partly that you just can't help but embody it when you're wearing it. End quote. She also described how the discussions in the play about power and legitimacy are founded in the rhetorical skills taught to lawyers from the Inns of Court, who were closely associated with that early period of early modern theatre, which, of course, resonates when the play is being performed in the replica of the globe. She speaks about trying to fill the 400-year gap between the play's premiere and now, through not only the language, but in the costuming and the visual aesthetic of the production. She also notes that, quote, It's really rare to do a play where the distance between you and the character is so far, and also the way they think is so far. So what you realise is that he's writing for lawyers to come along and learn how to take a position and hold an argument, how to speak rhetoric, and suddenly you realise how much legal language there is in this play. When they're talking about changes... They're talking about citizens. They're talking about young girls. They're talking about the death of children. But they're all holding really strong positions, and the speed of thought is unlike anything. But to get into the minds of these strategies has taken us all a really long time, because it's just not the way we think anymore. End quote. With that slant on the play, it's easy to see how Richard is undermining the institutions and the rights of citizenship and how he is using xenophobia, propaganda, lies and deceit. It's all there in the play, and the intention is that there should be no doubt when the audience leave this production that this is a comment on where we were and also on where we are. These traits can all be seen in the extremes of leadership today. One of the more daring aspects of this production is that, alongside the severe cutting of the original lines, some modern lines have been added. To Shakespeare are added snatches of Hitler, of Goebbels, Andrew Tate and of Donald Trump. It sounds crazy, but listen to this. Was ever woman in this humour wooed? Was ever woman in this humour won? I'll have her, but I'll not keep her long. I'm automatically attracted to beautiful women. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. Just kiss. Don't even wait. When you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. On the day I was there, this got a sort of nervous laugh. We recognised this was not all Shakespeare. Maybe some recognised it as mashed up with Trump. There are other examples, some of them very subtle, others, like the one I just quoted, less so. I'm sure I remember something like describing Richmond's advancing army as scum from Calais, referencing current illegal migration issues in the UK. And in perhaps a reference to current political ethics, Richard declared that the main thing is that they mention us again and again. It is part of bridging the 400-year gap that Terry speaks about. She wanted to emphasise the connections with today that the production sought, and in the moment, I think it worked. We all picked up on that change and therefore thought about those lines a bit more. But it is a somewhat heavy-handed approach. Some will think that these parallels are not difficult to discern just from the rendering of the original script, and is such tinkering, to use the politest term possible, really necessary when the messaging is pretty clear anyway? The strong thread of misogyny in the play is in the original and clear in this production too. The first time we see Richard with another character, he is in full flow of insults against the king's wife and his mistress, while managing to cast them as the bad actors in the jailing of Clarence. This is when men are ruled by women, as Richard sneers. Later in the play, he leaves the former Queen Elizabeth in no doubt about his power over her. In effect, he is a blackmailer while seeking the hand of her daughter, his niece. As Elizabeth leaves, he expresses his contempt for her, calling her a relenting fool and shallow, changing woman. This plays into the thinking of the time, where the weakness of the female flesh, as the biological cycles were interpreted, 
was also seen as meaning that women were fundamentally incapable of consistent principles. Elizabeth's position, like the Lady Anne's, is, by this stage, quite hopeless. Once this production of the play at the Globe had opened, most of the argument about the casting of an able-bodied actor died down. But what had gone before was a keen example of how social media and unfettered criticism, a large portion of which at least was coming from a position of no knowledge about the production, could become dangerous. Terry spoke of the hate directed towards her and Shakespeare's Globe more generally. She found her duty of care towards the company of her fellow actors compromised when Equity, the UK Actors' Union, issued a strongly worded statement about the casting. These few lines from the longer statement are the crux of the issue, and I quote, Equity's policy is to support the casting of a deaf or disabled character by a deaf or disabled artist, with first consideration given to those artists who have lived experience of the specific disability being portrayed. The process of casting such roles should be open, transparent and accessible. The Globe's casting of Richard III does not meet that standard. End quote. Now, I think it's difficult to speak to their position exactly, as I feel sure that it is more nuanced than this part of the statement makes it sound. But it seems to me that we get here to the heart of the argument about how far actors are permitted to act and inhabit a role that is far from their lived experience. Which then becomes conflated with a discussion about how far actors with some type of disability should be promoted into roles that feature that condition or something similar. In the case of Richard III, there have been a few successful productions featuring disabled actors, perhaps most significantly the RSC's 2022 production starring Arthur Hughes, but it's not that many. On the other hand, should we have been denied Olivier's Richard, or Anthony Shares, or Benedict Cumberbatch's, or any of the many other fine and memorable performances by other able-bodied actors? Having said that, 2024 does feel like the time for a female-led company to take on this story about the most male of tyrants and to give voice, at last, to the female victims of tyranny. Like no other play, Richard III shows how in Shakespeare's world the concept of tyrant and rapist was closely linked. Is that so far from our own time, where the rhetoric of populists shows that male behaviours, machismo, is still a powerful force in politics. It is only if we stick to Shakespeare's physical description of Richard that there is an issue with this aspect of the play, and Terry has proved that the play works without the physical manifestation of Richard's black heart. We understand why Shakespeare wrote what he did, but we don't need this particular element to be evident and even the main talking point of a production to still enjoy the play. So when I decided to speak about this production, I thought I would be talking about the issues of cross-gender casting in Shakespeare, but in fact, this became the thing that I thought about least while I watched the play. I could see from the runtime that the play had been cut significantly, which worried me, but did not, in the end, impact my enjoyment of it. I heard some of the new additional lines, I'm sure there were some that I missed, and recognised them as not Shakespeare. But apart from initial surprise... I thought that worked quite well. I enjoyed being in the throng of the groundlings and seeing a group of schoolchildren being completely engaged with the play. I liked the way we as a crowd were encouraged to be part of the play, to jeer at Buckingham, to make way as Margaret made her way onto the stage, and then to cheer Richard, but then to be amazed by his audacity. As Richard, Michel Terry did find a rapport with the audience. In the intimacy of Shakespeare's globe, particularly amongst the groundlings, Richard's conspiratorial asides are particularly effective. However, I can't quite completely enthuse about the production. For me, it played into the caricature, into the grotesque of Richard, just a bit too much. He, and some of the other characters, became a little shouty, and I think overall the production would have benefited from being taken down a notch or two. For sure, we laughed at Richard, but, I thought, just a bit too easily. And the more of a caricature he became, the less shocking were his deeds. In this production, 
Richard sat on the throne while Lady Anne drank poison in front of him. He didn't even look at her as she lay rigid on the stage for a long time before her body was dumped down the hole in the floor of the stage that served for all the corpses. But I don't feel, and I didn't sense around me, revulsion at this truly horrific act that it undoubtedly was. Michel Terry, I thought, needed to find just a hint of humanity, a drop of uncertainty, a speck of feeling that just might have made all the difference in our appreciation of the horrific human that Shakespeare would have us believe Richard III really was. Next time, after all this dark history and problematic kings, things get a bit more light-hearted with a bit of comedy. Ah, but it's another play where modern sensibilities clash with the early modern mindset, and Shakespeare once again confounds us with his portrayal of the power relationships between men and women. Join me next time for Shakespeare's most controversial comedy, The Taming of the Shrew. In the meantime, please join the Facebook page or group or find the podcast on Instagram or X just to keep up to date with new episodes and other theatre-related things. If you do feel able to help out with the cost of running the podcast, then please head over to Patreon where you will find additional content for a small monthly fee or a one-off donation. You can find details of ways to support the podcast in other ways at the New Look website, which is www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. I look forward to your company next time, but if you do have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via x at thoetp. Mm-hmm.